So now that you're all here, I just want to say a really, really warm welcome. Thank you for coming to this community engagement Zoominar. It's all about community hubs, supporting our communities through COVID and beyond. And a really big thank you and for coming to our guest speakers. Um, thank you. One of our guest speakers is actually in her car, in a car park. Right. This is what I call running from one thing to the other. So, um, so thank you for coming. I thought I would just like to start by saying to all of you, every single one of you who has been involved in supporting the community over the last few weeks and months, thank you very, very much. It has meant so much to our communities. The things that you've been out there doing, collecting prescriptions, sorting out people's food parcels, befriending people on the telephone, all of these amazing things that you've done. It, well done you and thank you. It means everything to our communities. People are so grateful. They have seen the church in action at a time of a national worldwide pandemic. I know that many of you are really exhausted. You have, you've gone to infinity and beyond with this and you're now running still, but, where, but with batteries lo looking a bit low. I know some of you are completely fed up with all the changing guidelines, opening churches, closing churches, watching the general public going to Costa Coffee and Starbucks, but still not able to open the cafe, but you've hung in there with it and well done. I'm with you. I know it is really hard. Thank you all for everything. And what we're going to be doing now is talking about the way forward. We're now facing this new normal, whatever it is. And one of the one of the golden opportunities of new normal is that we don't have to do the things the same way that we did them before. And that is actually quite a blessing for a number of us, I think. We've done community cafes, places of welcome, whatever you want to call them, for a long time. And some of you are going to open more. We've run community Zooms all through this. And we, some of you are going to be opening chatties. Chatty is sort of a halfway house between not doing anything and not being able to open the cafe. So we have St. Augustine's Gillingham are opening chatty on the 23rd of July. We have St. John's in Mecklenburg opening their chatty um, that week, I think. Um, Peace Church have already done it, but they're in Whitstable. They've been open for a couple of weeks. So we have, we can, any, the sky's the limit. We can do this, we know how to do it, and we are doing it and we're going to do more. Community hubs, they are probably going to be the way forward for our people in our communities. They started out with just putting on the kettle, making a cup of tea, welcoming people in, that was it. As people came in, they brought their interests with them. They liked puzzles, they wanted to do games, they wanted to do crafts, they brought their knitting. Suddenly we were buzzing. Then we began to know them even more and we could see what the needs were. Maybe they needed a little bit of advice with their budgeting. Maybe they needed a little bit of support writing that CV or sorting out that issue. So we provided advocacy. We provided debt advice. We provided furniture. Some of you have provided food and meals. Some of you have gone stratosphere, I can't find the word. Um, and you're now taking people to pantomimes and out from, from St. Mary's in Greenhide. They now have four coach loads of people going to the seaside. This is all about the local. The community hubs are not one size fits all. It's about meeting the local needs of local people, showing the love of the church to those people through whole person care. And when we don't have the skill, we invite in our partners. We have partner agencies who do everything from community gardening to healthy walks to all sorts of things. So we work with our partners so that we can provide this whole person care. And when we do it, we do it really well. We have lots of experience. We know what we're doing. What we need now is to open more. Now, whether they're going to open in the church right at this moment, or whether they're going to be on Zoom or some other means, that's what we're going to do. And so what I've done this evening is I've invited some partners in. Some of them are partners we already work with. Some of them are new because this could be part of our new normal. Some of them you'll think, oh, that's great for my community, this would just fit the bill. Some of you will think, no, that's not the one for us. We actually need something a little bit different. So whatever it is, whether it's you need mind, whether you need your um, adult education, whether you need homeless support, we can do it together and we will. So I'm going to start this evening by handing over to 
Bishop Simon. But before I do, I, we did ask you to have a little think about what you might like to do later on when you go into meeting rooms. Meeting rooms have pushed our technology to the limit, I have to tell you. So I'm just going to read out your options again. And I would really appreciate it, and I know Jenny would, if you could press in, go into chat and press the number that you would like. So I'm just going to, um, so if you could stop, I know you're all nattering amongst yourselves already, but if you could stop nattering for a minute, otherwise Jenny's going to have to read all the nattering too. And just think about where you want to go. And this is the options. Room one. So number one is if you want to go and listen to Heidi talking about, Heidi is the operations manager for social farms and gardens. She's going to talk about community gardening and social farms. She's in number one. Number two is going to be Keith from my team who's going to talk about places of welcome, community cafes and drop-ins, the mechanics of getting one started. You can see I've got the places of welcome sign up. I've got loads of these banners. You can have one for free. Emma Tanner is here from the Princess Project. She is going to be talking about supporting vulnerable young mums, mum to mum befriending, parenting and family support. And she's going to be in room three. So room three is the Princess Project. I feel like I'm doing the bingo. Room four is Julia Burton-Jones. Julia is our um, dementia specialist. And in that meeting room, she's going to be talking about Anna Chaplincy and Anna Friends. So that's number four. Room number five is going to be Sarah Wallace from the Just Finance Foundation. She is talking about how we can do free budgeting advice. Now, a lot of you do CAP or CMA or a number of things. This one is a free one. So please go and listen to Sarah if you know that your community would benefit from budgeting advice and all things to do with finance. Room number six, run out of hands now, is um, our lovely Nick from Living Well Bromley. Nick has been part of this huge drive to house homeless people. And I know a number of you are here because you've come in through homelessness. You want to support people. Nick is going to be repeating what he was doing at the whole person care session last week. So if any of you are here because you missed that, you need room number six. So there we go. I hope you've got it. I hope you're pressing those buttons. Um, and if anybody isn't in a meeting room when we go out, we'll sort you out, but have a little choice. Okay, so without further ado, that's enough from me. Let's hear from Bishop Simon, the Bishop of Tunbridge. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. We're in a place that's almost unrecognisable from the first decade of this century, the 2000s. It's hard to reach back to that moment when Facebook, Instagram and Twitter had yet to be created. People were protesting and arguing with one another over that decade's key moment, which was the invasion of Iraq. And the government had, in the words of its then chancellor, abolished boom and bust. But here we are a handful of years later, heading into a second recession, which we are informed will overwhelm the first one. There was lots of anger over the first recession in 2008 because it emerged from a light, touch regulation finance culture where institutions were taking appalling self-interested risks with new financial instruments that frankly would have been barely ethical in Las Vegas. This was then followed by that decade of austerity where social security cuts were imposed on poorer people to make up for the recklessness of richer people. Many of the divisions we face today are a result of that. The second recession is different because it's emerged from the natural world. There's still a blame game, pointing figures, reckless Asian wet markets, overcautious scientists, bombastic world leaders, take your pick if you must. But the coming recession is more dangerous than the first, not just because of its size, but because it comes off the back of another recession that has already severely weakened many people and the systems that support them. It's like one life-threatening illness coming straight after another. And it's not easy to think about either, because recession is a word that makes us feel glum, weary or disbelieving. Even now, I hear of some who don't believe that there are people in the UK 
who can't feed their families and who think that food banks are a contract of the feckless. Some people can't seem to imagine an existence other than their own, or they choose not to believe it. The social impacts of the virus have hit all of us, which may finally give some pause for thought. There's loneliness, mental illness, relationship breakdown, domestic abuse and violence. There are lost jobs, mounting debts, homes at risk, especially among renters. These problems are like dominoes for the most vulnerable, toppling one on top of the other. Many people will be experiencing these challenges for the first time, and as they do, some of the shocks will be unexpected. The systems they thought were in place to look after them are much more precarious than they realised. The famous safety net for the needy has lots of holes in it. It's hard for some to access these systems because they require verbal and computer literacy. It's not clear where you start and after a few weeks it feels like a game of snakes and ladders but you keep landing on the snakes. The system is faceless and it can feel like no one really cares about you. There's only so much sympathy to go round, and that's not in the job description anyway. If you need to visualise this, watch a Ken Loach film, however hard you find it, like I, Daniel Blake, or Sorry We Missed You. Our systems can leave much to be desired at times, but there's another side to the story. There are charities, advice services, information points. Lots of people want you to get the support you need and to recover. They'll listen, give you time to space, space to cry and have help things to say at the end of it. They are fellow citizens with you. And many still have a deeper vision. You are a brother or a sister. It's sometimes said that there are too many services that they overlap and that they don't talk to one another. If true, then that's only reflecting back to the rest of us how we live and work. But there's another way of looking at it. That there are so many third sector services shows just how much love and care there is in this country, how many social entrepreneurs we possess. For a bewildered, suddenly vulnerable person it can be hard to know where to turn at first. They need clear, visible, local assistance and signposting, a place they can trust, where they know they will be listened to. And that is where community hubs come in and why churches should be running them. Much has been said about how responses to the current crisis will be bottom up rather than top down. The top is unlikely to give much money after the biggest bailout in UK history. And in any case, it cannot respond as quickly or as smartly to individual needs. The desire the knowledge is locally held, as are the resources and the volunteers. Churches are one of the biggest and best recognised buildings in almost every local community. And there's often great residual affection for them. And though the institutional church has an image problem, the local church fares much better. In the years that lie ahead of us, churches can use the sheer scale of their footprint to open doors to the services that people need to access but don't know how to. Public and third sector services that may lack visibility can set up shop midweek in our buildings. Clients can see what's on display. They can talk face to face, socially distanced perhaps, with real people, not automated voices, and they can return again each week if they choose. Meanwhile, the local church can offer a particular ministry, one of hospitality to those in need, offering tea and cake, a listening ear and a warm welcome and an equally genuine embrace of those agencies making use of shared physical space with whom we have so much in common. Our minds have been messed with 
by this virus. People have experienced loneliness or mental illness or instability or all of them. After so long in lockdown and now a physically wary culture, they need people to speak to, a sense that they're and they aren't being seen simply as someone to keep a distance from. And the church itself is blessed by the experience. For Jesus told us how he is in every person we encounter, and especially those in need. So when we make people welcome, we make him at home. It's a simple but profound calling. And in opening our doors, we show people the church is theirs also. It can be so hard to cross the threshold of a church, say on a Sunday morning. The doors can be big and wooden, and you have no idea what will greet you on the other side. If you're unused to it, the service, the culture can seem so strange. No wonder we've had so many extra visitors online since the churches were shut in lockdown, because anonymity is so much easier. It's a reminder how important welcome and hospitality are, how attention to lots of small details can make a big difference. Experience shows that once people overcome the reluctance to enter church premises, the whole thing becomes much easier for them. They'll benefit from meeting different agencies and services, and they will benefit from engaging with the church because we have a gospel to share of how much God loves all of us in Christ. There is a mountain of existential need coming out of this crisis. People are thinking about their lives, about meaning and purpose, and we have something distinctive to share about this when we're invited to. Community hubs won't be for every church. That's for you to sift prayerfully. But my hunch is that their time has come. Another step in the recovery of what we've lost, the reimagining of what we're here for, and a way of reaching a new cohort of people who need help now in a way that some of them couldn't have imagined only weeks ago. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, um, Bishop Simon. That is so, so true, so true. Okay, so we're now going to go to the car park somewhere in Medway and we're going to talk to lovely Hannah Skerritt who is the Deputy Project Manager of the RBLI Employment Programme. Over to you Hannah. Hello, I hope you can hear me okay. I am, I'm actually on a busy main road, not a car park, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm enjoying the experience. It's, it's all new, it's exciting, just like the hubs. Um, I've set myself a timer so I won't overrun. Um, I work for RBLI and I specifically work on a project called Let's Get Working, which is designed to support people with long-term health conditions. Um, oh, could you go back to slide one for me? Sorry, Ian. There we go. So Let's Get Working is a social prescribing based project. And for me, social prescribing is exactly what you guys are doing. Your hubs will become a, a form of social prescription. The purpose behind social prescribing is to um, encourage people to use the community and peer-led support to help them manage various health conditions, be them physical or um, mental health conditions, and to take some pressure away from primary care and to empower people to take responsibility and enjoy progressing themselves forward. So we as a project support individuals who may have become socially isolated as a result of living with a long-term health condition and we support them through employability. Ian, could you do my next slide? Thank you. So I cover personally Medway, the project covers Kent um, and some parts of East Sussex. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of sort of number crunching really. Unemployment in the UK sat at 3.9%. When you look at Medway, it was only a little bit higher and I suspect that that's true of quite a few of the areas that you guys cover. But a further 3% of the population were claiming a long-term sickness benefit, which means in Medway, 8,000 people who are potentially living um, on the breadline or in poverty, who are potentially very, very isolated, which is something that happens very quickly when living with a health condition, who might have lost purpose, lost confidence, 
um, and needs some additional support. Now, my project uses employment and employability as, um, as a way of tackling all of those various issues. The benefits of work, far, far more than just the financial security, um, include things like social interaction, an opportunity to learn and build new skills, to have structure and routine, to have a sense of purpose and to build achievements and to build them with other people and work to common goals and being part of something bigger than themselves. Work doesn't need to mean paid, it could be voluntary. I think anybody who's experienced redundancy or retirement can say that actually for everybody, what we do is integral to our sense of self and how we feel about ourselves and how we express ourselves. When you introduce yourself to somebody, you might say, hi, I'm Ian, I'm an architect. Um, you know, it's that integral to who we are that we use it as part of our introduction. But work in this sense doesn't need to be paid. It could be voluntary work. It could be doing a few hours looking after friends, children. It could be putting in seven hours a week at the local community centre. Um, it could be working in a charity shop. It could be managing allotments. There's so much out there for voluntary. And that's something that we really advocate for people. It might be paid work, but again, it doesn't need to be 37 and a half hours a week. It could be four or five hours a week. So our project really supports people in understanding what work will look like for them as individuals um, and how they can benefit from it and how they can become perhaps more financially independent or at least more financially secure and how they can balance the benefit um, system against the working system. Um, so that they maximise what they've got and they get the most out of it. Could you do my next slide, Ian? I feel ever so vulnerable not doing my own slides. It's, uh, it's quite hilarious. Um, where am I for time? Okay, I've got 59 seconds left. Community hubs are amazing. People who are vulnerable cannot always face coming into a town centre. They need somewhere on their doorstep. They need somewhere that they feel safe walking to, that they don't have to get on a bus for, where they're going to know the people that are in there because they've seen them in their local corner shop. They need to feel safe and only you guys really can do that. You're the only organisation that has a space on every street corner. You don't have to have RBLI in, although as you can see on my amazing slide, we are very cool. Um, you could have organisations like the National Career Service who offer a really light touch approach. Um, you can have the Shore Trust, you could have the Job Centre, you could have Citizens Advice. All of those organisations will come to you and deliver some form of employability or employment support services. What I would urge all of you, please, whoever you choose to use, and um, you are more than welcome to get in touch with me and talk about how RBLI might be able to help, but whoever you choose to use, please, please include employability. I'm done. Include employability in your, um, in your service provision. It is absolutely integral to people's survival, and it is something that does much, much more than give them the financial security. It, builds their sense of self and sense of self-confidence and it's what will build your communities as well. I'm done, I'm done, you can start all over again. Uh, Hannah, before you go, first of all thank you very very much um, for, for, for that, what you said and also just to say to everyone, Hannah does already come to our community hub at St Augustine's in Gillingham, don't you Hannah? And you I work do, yeah. us there. And okay. Are, are you going off now, Hannah? Shall we I have to go? I have to run because my appointment's at half past. But thank, thank you, you so much. Bless for you. Me. Thank you very much. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. I've got Hannah's details and slides, and I'll share them all with you. Um, we're now going to hear from Sarah Wallace. She is the program director of the Just Finance Foundation. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, I had the practice with this earlier and it went a bit hard. I did. But I'm sure it'll be fine now. There we are. How are we doing? Are we working all right? Yep. Excellent. Um, so uh, I'm Sarah. I work for the Just Finance Foundation. Um, just to give you a bit of background on who we are, um, we were set up by the Archbishop of Canterbury um, in 2016 um, following, he had a task group on affordable credit and savings. Um, you might know about his campaign against Wonga um, that um, had some really great results. And it was the same group that um, he formed that the rec one of the recommendations was that a charity was formed out of that. So Just Fan Finance Foundation was formed, and um, this is before my time. 
I've only been here a year. Um, we received the Church Urban Fund. We were put under the Church Urban Fund um, to be incubated and looked after until we were big enough to uh, run off on our own, which we are not yet, unfortunately. <laughs> so they're still doing a great job of helping us. Um, we're all about uh, fairer financial systems for people, so both changing the systems within which um, people work and live, but also around helping individuals to make the most of the situation that they're currently in. Um, so before um, the COVID uh, crisis, our main programme that we do most of our work on is Lifesavers, which is a programme of financial education in primary schools. Uh, it's a brilliant programme. It's what made me want to come and join the charity. Um, it's about getting early, early interventions. They estimate that children start forming their financial attitudes around age seven. Um, so it's really important that uh, we start financial education early. Um, it's a values based programme. It actually came out of the Church of England uh, Mission and Public Affairs team. They designed the programme um, and it was originally in Church of England schools, but now it's open to everybody. Um, and the idea is we train up teachers to be able to deliver financial education and we set up savings clubs in partnership with credit unions to give children the real life experience of saving and getting those good habits. Um, values based, based on the values of wisdom, generosity, thankfulness and justice. So it focuses everything around those rather than just learning the mechanics of you know money in and money out and taxes and things like that it really focuses on people's values and attitudes because that will what make will make people change their behavior rather than just the knowledge itself um so we've had some really great results from lifesavers uh, we're working with these these stats are a little bit out of date but we're working with about 130 schools now um the majority are in the northeast the northwest the southwest and london um, but we are always seeking more funding to be able to work with more schools. And we just were just launching in the Wiltshire area um, and in the Nottinghamshire area when the crisis hit. So it completely changed what we were doing. Most of our staff uh, were recruited to work with schools. They're based in the field. Um, and I had three staff who'd started literally two weeks before the crisis. So um, I'd just taken them on. Fortunately, they had laptops and phones and everything. And then we were all locked down. So we had to think about um, what we would do next. Um, I just want to talk about the current situation briefly. Um, before, uh, the, before COVID hit, um, one in four adults in the UK had less than £100 in savings. So really, we're talking not well equipped to be able to deal with any kind of financial crisis. Um, over three million people have applied for universal credit since the start of the lockdown. Um, and finding out, you know, we've got nine million people on the furlough scheme. And when that comes to an end later this year, a lot of those people are at risk of redundancy. I think unemployment is going to soar um, and the stat that I found out today 39% uh, of people have had an income drop and the average reduction is 34% now to me one of the reasons that's such an important stat is it's very um it shows how many people are affected this is not a few people this is not people who haven't planned well this is not you know a few poor unfortunates this is affecting a huge amount of the population population already and this is before the furlough scheme ends so this is going to have big effects on people we've got a lot of people behind on their rent payments um, so there is a crisis brewing um, and in some ways I think it's been dampened down by all the support that's been available which is brilliant but it means that once that support starts being withdrawn we're going to see the real effects of the hit to people's incomes um, so we developed the COVID cash course. Um, this was actually designed by uh, one of my team. We previously uh, run um, a course called Cash Smart Credit Savvy, which we run um, in various community locations across England. Um, and once we knew that we couldn't work in schools anymore, we had to think about what can we do? Where's our expertise? Who do we know? How can we help the people that need it most? And so the COVID cash course, came out of that we don't work directly with beneficiaries ourselves um, with end users so we had to think about who do we know who can we work through and how we can get the information into their hands so we formulated a course aimed at staff and volunteers working in churches and community settings um, and it's designed to cover the main areas um, we talk about financial worry because of the um, mental health hit we talk about the loss of income we talk about what helps available um, how people have to adjust their budgets and people in debt how they can get help with that 
Um, so when people sign up for the course, um, we do a train the trainer course to help people be able to deliver this in their local communities. And once you've done that, it gives you access to all of the resources, all of the scripts. Um, it can be delivered either face to face, online or over the phone, either in groups, or you can cut the information down for one to one to make it appropriate to indiv individual people. And we're updating it all the time uh, based on feedback, based on changes to the current situation. So um, we're working through people um, to get this information out there. Um, so far we've trained over 300 community and church workers um, from a variety of backgrounds, um, mostly from churches and from smaller charities and community organisations, although we have actually had a couple from some major um, utility providers who are getting calls from people who are struggling with their finances and wanted to know what other help was available. So it's really nice to know that you know, even people working in those jobs want to be able to help in any other ways that they can. The feedback's been amazing so far. Um, so we're really pleased with it. And we've actually received some funding to be able to roll this out more widely. And um, all churches are supporting this project um, alongside Nationwide have also given us some funding. So we are currently in the process of expanding this. Um, we've got particular staff and partners that we're working with in Newcastle, Middlesbrough, Nottinghamshire, the Black Country and Plymouth at the moment but we're really keen to work across the country and we don't have limits on where we can work especially given that we're delivering this remotely so we're really keen to be able to get the information out there and help people it's all free for churches and community workers to be able to get the information so that, they, so that you can help the people that you're working with thank you oh you're done Sorry. i think so <laughs> can i can i thank you so much i just want to say to everybody this is um this is really exciting. I, you, I don't think you know this, Sarah, but we were one of the pilot dioceses for Lifesavers and I was in the Archbishop's team, the one oh. that got that done. So we're really proud of it, and we, but we've only got it in the London Borough of Bromley because that's the way the funding works. So if anybody, you know, if we ever want to talk about more, we'll be up for that. The other good news is that Keith has done the training um, with Sarah as well. So we, we're ready to go on that and we want to work with you. And I'd love to talk to you more about if any churches want to actually be part of what you were just talking about, I think we'd be up for it. Okay, so now on my schedule, I've put in, I can't see myself on the screen, I've obviously pressed the wrong button, but on my schedule, I've just put in a little stretch now, because we've been sitting down for a while. So if you all want to just get up and stretch, maybe stick the kettle on ready for before you go into the um, meeting rooms. You've just got about 30 seconds now, because we're running a bit late, but just have a little stretch. Oh. I should have put my countdown counter on. We're supposed to roll our shoulders, aren't we? Shoulder rolls when you're in front of the computer. And then we're supposed to turn our heads. Like this. Am I the only one turning my head? I can't look and see if you're turning your heads, but hopefully we are. I'm going to put my head down, but I don't put it back. Otherwise, there'd be a great click. <laughs> Because I've been in front of the computer since about five o'clock this morning. Oh, are we all done? Okay. Have you had a chance to stretch? I hope you have. Okay. Where are we going now? We are now going to be. Um, oh, we're now going to be hearing from uh, Bill Ronan. Now, Bill is um, a public health project officer, and uh, he has worked on the A Better Medway project. Interestingly enough. But Bill is going to talk to us for the next seven minutes about social isolation. So over to you, Bill. Now we might have to, have we unmuted Bill? Hang on, let me just find where he is. Um, I can see that we need to unmute him. Where are you, Bill? I can't see you. Can you wave? Jennifer, you need to find Bill and unmute him. The poor guy can't, can't be heard. William Ronan it is. I uh, can't see him. Hang on everybody, just talk amongst yourselves for a minute. There we are. Okay, here we are. Hopefully, um, I've got uh, seven minutes. I'll try and do this in six. I'm going to share my screen with you, I hope. I'm trying to work with two, two mice. Uh, now, can I share my screen? Just bear with me. Trying to work across two computers. 
Here we go. Share the screen. Is that going to work? Jenny, have we? That's it. We've done That's it. it. Well done. Brilliant. Thank you. Is that what? Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, just very quickly. Um, he says, we all know that strong supports and relationships uh, are there and they protect uh, people during an emergency. Those strong relationships and networks have never been more important than now. Millions of people across the UK feel as though they have no one to turn to and that if anything happened to them, nobody would be there or notice if something happened, which is an extremely troubling um, uh, statement uh, and an indictment of uh, society, I think, today. We, even before COVID-19, social isolation and loneliness affected as many as one in five of people across the United Kingdom. It's as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's as bad as obesity. It's as bad as a lack of exercise. And that's before we deal with the last four months and the crisis of COVID-19. And over the last four months, we have stopped connections, social connections. We've stopped meeting people in person. We've stopped hugging or touching. We've stopped going into the office or into schools or into A&E, at a time when we've been encouraged to be socially distanced, we've never needed to be more socially connected than ever before. And during this time, people have become anxious and become ill. Thousands have become ill and others have sadly lost loved ones. We've never been more lonely or isolated and vulnerable than we, have, than we are when we have to deal with the tragic loss of a loved one. Having to do that remotely must be extremely uh, difficult. And too many people have had to deal with that over the last month. And we are facing higher levels of mental health, uh, health and well-being issues. Grief, unemployment. Death rates have been highest amongst our BME groups. People living in the most deprived areas have been particularly hardest hit. People with long-term health conditions, medical appointments and operations have been cancelled. Support groups have been closed and people have been even too anxious to visit healthcare settings. How is that and why and what are we going to do coming out the other side of this? Our work in Medway over the last four months has identified a series of common challenges, exacerbation, uh, exacerbating social isolation and loneliness, but none of it is a surprise to us working in partnership. Social isolation, deprivation, poverty, environmental factors, many of these issues are sadly common to our work day in and day out. I, there's been a lack of meaningful contact and connections there's a reduction of formal and informal support and increased anxiety and poorer mental health and well-being. This crisis has shown that in the most extreme circumstances, some of the ways in which important connections have been lost. But it has also demonstrated how people and communities have come together and support each other. Community hubs. We must move from welfare checking to meaningful connections. We need to move on from well-intentioned work together to genuine partnership with shared outcome vision statements. We need to remove cultural and structural barriers in establishing and maintaining strong relationships, continue to grow the social prescribing model and ensure it delivers for social isolation and loneliness. We need to work collaboratively across all sectors and specialisms and with people with lived experience of social isolation and loneliness. Together, we should continue to share learning, develop new solutions and drive forward a more holistic and coordinated approach to tackling social isolation and loneliness 
across Medway and beyond. Remember, when we think about illness, we build hospitals and GP surgeries. When we think about health and well-being, we build communities, neighbourhoods and people. And it's this through the community hubs we must do together. Thank you. Bill, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you. That was Bill from Public Health, um, the Public Health Department in Midway. Okay, and we're now going to be hearing from um, Julia Burton Jones. Julia is the diocesan Anna Chaplaincy lead, and she is a dementia specialist. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I've got some slides which are about to appear, hopefully, which Ian is going to navigate for us. I know that some of you might be wondering what on earth is an Anna Chaplin or an Anna Friend, um, whether you have heard of uh, those two roles. So I'll start just by describing the, these two new roles of Anna Chaplin and Anna Friend. So, Anna Chaplaincy is essentially community-based chaplaincy for older people of strong, little or no faith. And although I'm working within the Church of England, Anna Chaplaincy is essentially ecumenical in approach, spanning all Christian denominations. Can I have the next slide, please, Ian? It was first established in 2010 in Oldham under a covenant between the Anglican and the Methodist churches there. And the person who pioneered Anna Chaplaincy was someone called Debbie Thrower, a former broadcaster and also a reader in the Church of England. And Debbie continues to be the national lead for the Anna Chaplaincy network. In 2014, Anna Chaplaincy became part of the Bible Reading Fellowship, which is also the home of, of Messy Church so that we could grow a national network. And it was about that time uh, that we started exploring in Rochester Diocese and began to develop Anna Chaplaincy, in our case, with a focus on the spiritual needs of people living with dementia and their families. And we now have a team of 70 Anna Chaplains and Anna Friends. And the first two Anna Chaplains in Canterbury Diocese were appointed in September and there's another group of 10 preparing to join the team. We offer training, support and networking so that we can develop skills together and understand the spirituality of later life. So as this next slide asks, what's missing if spiritual care is absent? To offer holistic person-centred care to older people, we need to pay attention to the spiritual. And that's where Anna Chaplinty comes in. We enable older people to be heard as they explore the bigger questions of life. To make sense of what's happened in their lives and to prepare indeed for the end of their lives. There are spiritual tasks that confront us in later life and older people are, we find, very attuned to these spiritual questions and appreciate conversations about the deeper things of life. Next slide please Ian. So Anna Chaplaincy has taken a different tack at this present time. And this slide shows how we practice before coronavirus. Pre-COVID, the team would be visiting people at home or in care homes, um, leading worship services, running groups for older people. Now they rely very heavily on telephone contact through doorstep calls, um, sometimes now happening um, where people can pop, pop um, to, the door, to the doors of people and just say a quick hello and exchange a few words, or maybe perhaps meeting in the gardens of a local care home. Can I have the next slide, please, Ian? We are finding that the telephone is really invaluable, um, especially for the many people that we support who don't have internet access. So we're finding that many people have identified um, people in the community who just appreciate that weekly telephone call to check in and make sure that they're okay. Um, we've also been able to offer a lot of support and guidance to care home staff, care home 
uh, communities are a huge focus of the ministry that we do. And so we're trying to enable the staff to provide spiritual care. And indeed, um, just this week, the Bible Reading Fellowship have launched a new series of booklets for care homes on spiritual care. Next slide, please, Ian. We've identified several areas of concern. The pandemic has really highlighted the disadvantages faced by older people without access to the internet. And part of our advocacy role in Anna Chaplaincy has been to remind our churches that some people cannot access virtual worship or indeed online socialising. We're also very aware of the disproportionate effect on our black and minority ethnic, Asian and minority ethnic communities of COVID and we're considering the implications of this. We're aware of the strains that have been faced by a huge number of family carers and indeed the people who are taking on family caring roles for the first time during the crisis. Their support services and the help um, that's available to them has really been stripped away during lockdown and they face invisible strains and incalculable pressures. We heard tragically of a local carer who took her own life recently because of the pressures of caring alone for her husband in his dementia. We also fear for the long-term impact of COVID on people with dementia. Not only has the virus taken many lives prematurely where people were living with dementia, but the impact of isolation and lack of contact with friends and family is causing rapid deterioration in the condition for many alongside struggles with anxiety and depression. Captain Alzheimer's Society report published just yesterday found eight in ten people living alone with dementia have seen no friends or family since March. A third of those surveyed said they now feel like giving up. A third said that they'd lost the confidence to leave their homes since the pandemic, despite the loosening of some lockdown rules recently. And finally, We've all seen the distressing headlines about the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on care homes. And I recently consulted the Anna Chaplaincy team and produced a paper for the diocese about the impact on care homes. There have been a lot of encouragements too. You can look at the next slide. Our churches and Anna Chaplaincy have adapted really well to meet the needs of older people in lockdown. Many volunteers are spending hours and hours of their time making weekly calls to isolated older people. The new forms of spiritual care that we've discovered can continue after lockdown eases to allow housebound older people to be linked with church and community. And the Daily Hope free phone service has proved hugely popular with our older people. Care home staff too have been really encouraged by the faithful support of their local church and these partnerships have been strengthened during the pandemic. It's made us more aware of social isolation too. An initiative of Churches Together in Gravesend has delivered meals to all the people in sheltered housing and demonstrated a huge need for friendship so that Churches Together is now calling for the churches in Gravesend to link with the schemes, the sheltered housing schemes, so that we can continue to offer this support after lockdown eases. So next slide, what of the future? Where should our energies be directed? Anna Chaplaincy is really focused on how we support the care home sector in recovery. We anticipate staff facing problems with post-traumatic stress disorder and moral injury. There is anger over perceived neglect of social care. We can help provide the necessary space for these difficult feelings to be expressed and be a voice for a neglected workforce. We will support the staff, residents and relatives through the grieving process, helping celebrate the lives of residents and staff members who have died. We will consider how intergenerational initiatives might enable more people who are older to benefit from the internet. And churches will undoubtedly need a lot of support and guidance in restarting their many groups and social activities for older people. But we mustn't lose the one-to-one -one support provided through the pandemic, which has actually really deepened relationships and been a lifeline for many. A recent survey, survey of Anna Chaplaincy locally 
found that 85% of respondents felt their church could do more to support older people if there were more volunteers. We hope that the altruistic offer of voluntary support made during the crisis will be harnessed for future befriending of older people and that churches can play their part in enabling this to happen. Thank you. Julia, thank you so much for that. Thank you very much indeed. So we've heard about some money, back to jobs, social isolation, older people. It's now time to go into your group. So um, Jennifer is going to move you in and you'll have 15 minutes in the group and then you'll all be brought back again. So enjoy the time in the groups, have a good discussion um, and I'll see you in about 15, well, I will see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Be coming back now because um, they're all popping back in now, the rooms are closed. Fantastic. Well, I hope that you all had a great time in the rooms. I hope that you, there was time for you to, to chat um, and those conversations can carry on forward. What we're going to do now is just with Keith, um, I just want to talk about the next steps um, from here. But first of all, we're going to have a little session of questions and answers. So if any of you have any questions for anyone that's on the panel, any of the speakers at all, then would you like to um, tap them in on the chat section? Um, and while you're, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for them, and so will Keith. So Keith, if you keep an eye on the chat now for any questions coming in. We did have a question earlier. Which yeah, I've got, I've got, in fact, I've got several for you already, oh, Caroline. Right. Oh right, okay. Then so there's away. two for you. So Keith, could you direct them to the people that want? Will yep. be hands answering. Yep. The first one's for you. Can everybody have links to the recorded version of this evening? Yes. Oh, well, how are they going to get them? I will send them to you on an email. Uh, no, I will send you the link and Jenny, you, you, it'll be a link that comes and when you click on it, the recording will be there. Lovely. Um, question for Sarah from Just Finance. Sarah's there. Hello. How does Lifesavers differ from cap money? I, I did answer that one in the chat, um, but um, Lifesavers is our financial education programme for primary schools, so that one is aimed at children. Um, our the programme that we do for adults at the moment is the COVID cash course. Um, how we differ from CAP is that we're not debt advisors um, and we don't provide sort of debt advice solutions. Um, what we do is we train up people who work in the community with the information, the latest information on what support is available financially around things like income, support with bills, debt, budgeting, all of that kind of thing, so they can help people in their community. So um, yeah, they have, they have advice and permissions that we don't have. Lovely. Thank you. Um, social prescribing, I covered this in my group. Um, can't, I think, in fact, I think two people mentioned social prescribing. So if I answer it, uh, that'll save those two people. Um, social prescribing is really signposting. Um, so it's often people who, um, uh, in social prescribing through doctor's surgeries, for instance, it's where people go and the doctor recognises that really it's um, a, an, an isolation or a loneliness issue or a mental health issue, they can give them non-medical prescriptions, which is where the name social prescribing come, and they direct them towards social activities, clubs and groups that they can meet with that will improve their, um, their health in that way. And community hubs and coffee mornings are often that same uh, sort of thing. So I think okay. I'll just add on the back of that, mm -hmm. that if you can, you can approach your local um, doctor's surgery, they will always have um, somebody there that will be able to talk about this. And we have done it. We have examples here in the diocese where we do social prescribing and some of the councils do too. Bromley Council is quite hot on it. Medway Council is looking at it. Where's, is Bill still with us? Are you still with us, Bill, to talk about this? Sorry, I joined, uh, apologies, I joined, uh, I think it was Keith's room, Keith's room late. I just want to say and make it very clear from a Medway perspective, social prescribing is more than just simply signposting. It provides a supportive whole system framework for the prescription to become action. It's not just a bolt on, 
for other services. I'm putting this in the, the Zoom chat and it's based on relationship building and effective partnership working. Now we would have gone live on the 1st of April with our social prescribing team of which at that point I was not a part of. You'll know that I'm leading on the work around social isolation loneliness. But over the last three, four months, uh, there's, there's a lot of commonality and I've been aligned to kind of do some consultancy to our social prescribing team offer. And if it's done properly, it will be about ongoing relationship with, the, with a link worker. Now, just be cautious about the term link worker, because we all know through our hubs, through the chatty cafes, through the places of welcome, we are all doing social prescribing in many ways, but we don't have a term link worker or, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, titles. And we must try to avoid titles where we can. And it's not a panacea for all systemic health and societal issues. And the challenge I have put to the team and to Medway is if uh, we have to build those relationships in, not simply signposts, because if somebody, and I always use the example of uh, indoor bowls, if somebody turns up and wants to do indoor bowls and then after a week or two weeks leaves, does that mean that they're not socially uh, adept? It might be that the bowls club was not competitive and they are or vice versa. And it will be the key role of those link workers to keep that ongoing relationship, not simply signposting and, and then letting them drop off, drop off the edge of a cliff. Um, and it will be, I mean, for me, the work we are going to do in our community hubs and working with Keith will be centre for any success we have in Medway if we're going to make this work. I like the sound of that, Bill. Thank you. And you must, we must introduce you to St. Augustine's as well. I'll do that afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would just say the, the, with the social prescribing, the hard work on, from the church hub point of view is to make sure that they keep up to the information going in up to date. So if you're doing something like healthy walks, which we do here a lot, a lot of us of churches do that, and we'll train you to do it by the way, if you want to do that. If you decide that your healthy walk is on a Tuesday at 2.30, so people come in your, in your community hub, they have a nice cake, then they go on the community walk, then they come back. But suddenly whoever runs it says, oh, I think we're gonna swap that to a Friday afternoon. And if you don't tell the doctor surgery, it can become a massive problem. So it's about it's about keeping those lines of communication open. But we can help you with that, easy peasy. Okay, any more questions, Keith? I think we've got uh, there are there are hundreds of questions oh. and hundreds of answers. So can I just say if we don't have a chance to answer them all now, I will send them all out to the speakers and I will send you the, a transcript of those responses. Well, I don't think we're going to have time for them all. What I was going to suggest was if if people want to go into the chat and press on the three little dots in the bottom right hand side, um, it does give them an option to save the chat and they can then look at that and then see both the answers uh, as well as the questions. Um, Let's so have some more questions, Keith. Okay, there's one on safeguarding for you on community hubs and safeguarding, how that whole issue is addressed. Okay, so the volunteers in your community hub need to be go through the safe recruitment process with your parish safeguarding officer. So that's their opportunity to talk about anything that you need to know. And then you will know whether there's anything there that you want to talk through with them. So they might have a criminal record, but they might have done something when they were 16 and it was a mistake. Whatever it is, you can talk it through with them. So involve your parish safeguarding officer in the recruitment of any volunteers. And that's really for everyone's safety. That's, that's what we do. We don't normally have under 18s working in the community cafes and places of welcome. But if you, again, you would need to talk to your parish safeguarding officer if that's something that you would like to do. Um, at the moment, we are asking volunteers to take CO as a bare minimum and C1 They've just been renamed and I'm just trying to think which is now the basic safeguarding training. I think that's C1. But um, we do ask the, uh, the parish safeguarding officers know who needs to do that. My feeling is you can never be too cautious and it's quite nice for people to go through training. If volunteers join the National Trust, they have to do training. If they come to us, training is good. 
CO and C1, I think, are perfect for all our volunteers, and they get a certificate at the end of it. I think there's a question for Nick. We love the name Living Well. Can we use it elsewhere or is it copyrighted? Not copyrighted. My heart is that we have living wells all over the place. <laughs> oh, that would be brilliant. And uh, really, I'd be very keen to encourage anyone to develop a whole person approach. You don't have to copy everything we do, but some of the general principles we'd love to share with people and help you set up other living wells. Thank you. Um, a question for Julia. You use the term moral injury. Could you unpack a little what you mean by that? Yeah, it's quite a it's quite a complex uh, concept, but it's about when a health or care professional has to practice in a way that goes against their values and their principles because of the circumstances that they're in, and leaves them with a, a moral injury, a sense of having done something that they're, they're not they're not proud of and that they feel guilty about but through no fault of their own so say you had no PPE and that put your patients or your clients at risk those sorts of circumstances where you're feeling that you're passing on the virus to someone or you've taken home to your own family um, lots of things that we, we did in the beginning of the crisis we had no idea might cause harm um, because we didn't know what this virus was about. And um, so it's helping people being a listening ear and chaplaincy is something that can provide the safe space for people to work through those feelings of having had their professional integrity undermined by decisions that they were forced to make. You know, where doctors are having to choose between patients because there isn't enough life-saving equipment to, to save everybody. It's those sorts of situations. I hope that sort of... A good article was circulated at the start of the pandemic, which I can let people have if they think it would be useful. I think that's it, Caroline, I think. Okay. Um, oh, I think we've got time for one more. Go on, Keith. Oh, um, in terms of addiction recovery, how many community hubs or how many people are aware of and providing the recovery course? Do you know? So, <laughs> So at the moment, we we are supposed to be, we have three recovery courses going on any one time. We are um, supposed to be doing one in Gillingham as we speak. They, the recovery course guys that we work closely with, they are currently, they've made that into a digital recovery course. And the Gillingham team are hoping to run it very soon. If anybody wants to run the recovery course, the team are very welcome to train you on how to do that. And it really is, it's a it's a really wonderful course. It's it's not something you can just pick up, learn, deliver. You have to you have to go and see it in action. Um, uh, Kevin um, puts people through their paces just to make sure that they're going to deliver it well, and they do support it with the team. Um, actually, Nick, you do you do recovery? You work with addicts, Nick. What sort of recovery do you do with your addicts at Living Well? Okay, so we we work closely with Bromley Drug and Alcohol Services, but we also work closely with um, Christchurch Beckenham, where the recovery course is held. And, um, and we can see where people would most benefit and also what stage people are at um, when, when it's appropriate for them to do the recovery course or whether they need to, to engage with the uh, Bromley Drug and Alcohol Services or do both at the same time so yeah so we, we uh, it's a very good course. It is good. Nick thank you very much. I think we will have to stop us, uh, answering questions there but we will get back to every single one will be answered so rest assured I will send that to you. Um, we took, well, just want to touch on next steps. Those of you who are going ahead with the housing initiatives which is whole person care around homeless people um, you will have been coming to Zooms already about that. If, you, if anyone here tonight wants to be involved in Housing the Homeless um, initiative, just let me know on an email and I will link you into your local group for that. 
Um, those of you who are interested in opening a place of welcome or a community cafe or a chatty or any of those things that are what I call at the, at the centre of the hub, this is the sort of the, the tea, coffee kind of that basis, please just email Keith at the moment um, or you can email me as well and we're going to do some online training on that and also we can talk to you about which agencies you might be wanting to involve right from the very beginning. Um, those of you who are wanting to go ahead and do something in partnership with one of the agencies or this has made you think, oh, I wonder what other agencies we could have, get in touch with me and we can have a chat about that. Or, um, and if there is anything else, we, could, we will help and support you. If you need any policies and you, or you're wondering what's happening with the government advice with churches, uh, look on the Church of England website at the Recovery Task Force. That is the sort of um, the latest information about what's going on. In terms of reopening, you need to talk to your vicar because at the end of the day, they will um, be working this in with all sorts of other things. So um, just because we can do something by law now doesn't necessarily mean that your church is going to do it yet. So, so just check out first and have those conversations. The Community Engagement Social Action Team is here to support you with anything, and we do, and those, so we're working with you, do be in touch and we will come and help you in whatever way it is. Um, I want to thank you for coming. Bishop Simon is going to do a summary for us now, aren't you, Bishop Simon? Thanks very much, uh, Caroline. Yeah, it's just to say one or two things. Firstly, uh, thank you so much to Caroline herself and Keith, uh, who pulled this together so well tonight. and. The speakers that we've had essentially um, summed up what I said in my original talk was that there are so many good people around who want to do the very best for their neighbours uh, and living out the commandments. And it's wonderful to have heard so many of them tonight. And I'm sure you'll go away energised by what you've heard. I just want to draw to your attention the analogy that I've used recently that some of you will be aware of. Um, what we've experienced over the last few months has been an earthquake been indoors, buildings have collapsed, there's masonry all over the place and rubble outside. As we re-emerge into that world, um, the unwise thing to do is to go to the first piece of masonry in a panic to try and lift it to find out what's beneath it. The smarter move is to walk around and to listen carefully for where the faint cries are coming from, because those are the locations we need to go to. So I'd really encourage you uh, although you may be very fired up right now in moving on to hit the ground listening to make sure that um, you're really hearing what the Lord is telling you to do and also hearing the cries of the needy around you in your community. Um, so, um, you know, we've had uh, several months of uh, should the churches be open, shouldn't they be open, disputations around this and that. We're going to move beyond that phase in due course. The key thing is in the time that lies ahead when we can do it safely, we want our churches to be known as places that are open, that people can come into, where they can find refuge, support, hospitality, welfare and salvation. That's what we want to be known for in the longer term. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to close with a prayer now, I think. Caroline, is that OK? Unless there's anything else you want to say? Okay. So if you'd like to join me, let's pray. Lord, you are Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. You knew this pandemic was coming our way when we didn't. And we thank you, you know the end from where we are now. We pray that you would lead us on as a good shepherd. And we pray particularly for those whose experience this year has been traumatic, demoralizing, profoundly discouraging and for those who are yet to experience those emotions because they still lie ahead of them you are a god who cares for the brokenhearted and we pray you draw near to them in spirit and draw near to them through us in the ministry that lies ahead of us so inspire us with your spirit of power and of love and of self-control this night May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you to everybody for coming. I look forward to hearing from you and seeing you again. This is the beginning of a journey and we're on it together and we're going to get there. Thank you very much to our guest speakers. Thank you very much to Bishop Simon. See you soon. Stay safe. God bless you. Bye-bye.